I work for Wikimedia in Brussels, where my top priority is um, an European copyright reform that would allow us to share more free knowledge online. And um, before I go ahead and give you a recap of what happened over the past 12 months in Europe when it comes to public policy, I want to take a few minutes to comment on um, recent, um, recent goings on, let's put it this way. So yesterday the UK uh, voted to leave the European Union, so soon it will be outside. And um, well, it's very important to well, try to leave emotions out for a little bit and uh, reflect on what that means for European copyright reform. Now, the first thing that I could think of that that means for us is that we'll be missing a very progressive voice in Brussels. The UK government was very, very open to copyright changes and to, and to really meaningfully reform copyright. Now, without the UK, we're basically stuck with um, France and Italy, which I'm sorry to say, but they are extremely conservative, with the neutral Germany and with a rather progressive Poland. Um, for our strategy in Brussels, that means that suddenly Spain became top priority. Without Spain pushing for meaningful copyright reform, we cannot get anything through in Brussels anymore. Um, a second thing that that means for public policy work when it comes to IP rights is that a lot of the um, British legislation will have to be changed in the coming years. Um, one example is the database rights. Well, if you read through the British law that transposes the database directive, it says that it, apply, um, it applies to every person or organization based in an EU member state. Well, soon the UK won't be an EU member state anymore, which means that they will have to reopen and reform their uh, own legislation, which for us then could mean a chance to actually meaningfully change it to make our life easier. Um, a third thing that that means is that once the, well, let's call it the divorce settlement is done, might take two years, um, there will be a new um, agreement between the EU and the UK. Now, we don't know whether that's just going to be a, um, a, a treaty, a trade treaty, or if it's going to be a really deep and meaningful cooperation agreement like with Switzerland. But either way, this new treaty between the UK and the EU will have an intellectual property rights chapter. Now, it is very important to work from Brussels and with Wikimedia UK to make sure that this future intellectual property rights chapter, um, well, doesn't hurt us. So, back to the original talk. <laughs> um, I always struggle where to start, but, you know, the EU policy efforts of Wikimedia are an ongoing um, story. And I always assume there are new people in the room, so I'll take a few minutes just to give you like a bit of a background why we started doing um, public policy work. Well, in '93 there was the copyright uh, term, uh, well, copyright duration directive, which extended copyright from lifelong plus 50 to lifelong plus 70 years. In 2001 there was the Information Society directive, which wanted to harmonize um, exceptions and limitations and to implement them all across the EU, but completely and miserably failed at doing so. Um, in 2006, there was the Harmonization of Copyright Terms Directive, which was supposed to like make um, copyright terms equally long everywhere, but I mean, in the end, the effect is that the Little Prince is now public domain in every EU country except for in France, where it's still copyright protected, um, which kind of poses a few complicated questions on what we are allowed and not allowed to do with that. Um, 2011, we got a copyright term extension for music recordings. In 2012, we got, um, well, let's call it half-baked orphan works directive, which means that we can't really digitize orphan works and use them on our projects. And in 2013, we got a collective rights management directive, which prohibits authors in collective rights management schemes to release single works of theirs under a freely free license that we can reuse. So at some point we've had enough. I mean, we didn't want to be just passive bystanders anymore when, when things that really influence our daily work are changed. Um, so, you know, we had a meeting like Wikimedians do. We set up a priority li list. We decided on a structure that from the very, very beginning said that there will be a little paid time going into advocacy, but that the majority of the work has to be volunteer driven and activist driven. And we started calling these volunteers weasels. So this was kind of the beginning. And the first really uh, big thing and really visible thing that we did 
um, was, um, well, ping-ponging. <laughs> Ping-ponging is the idea that um, whatever I do in Brussels doesn't only stay in Brussels, it sort of influences the work of people in, in Estonia or in Slovenia, and what they do in Estonia and Slovenia influences my work, and then my work then influences the work of the foundation. Basically, um, laws don't exist in a vacuum, they always influence each other in between the different levels of legislation, and the better our network is spread out to cover everything, and the faster we exchange information like a ping-pong ball, the bigger our advantage is vis-a-vis -vis the people who, let's say, don't want to change legislation the way we want to change it. So, the first thing we really, really did was last year's uh, European Parliament um, report on copyright reform. So, the European Parliament decided to fix its position on copyright reform, and originally they wanted to include freedom of panorama in that. Um, which was great, but then freedom of panorama got restricted to non-commercial uses only in, in the draft text, which for us would have spelled disaster. So, you know, we gathered a lot of people in a lot of countries. We, we drove a huge media campaign. I mean, it was, it, was, it was massively successful. And in the end, we actually even got over half a million. I mean, this is a bit old, but I mean, in the end, it was like 570,000 uh, petition signatories. And the great thing is we still have the emails of all these people, so we can reactivate them from time to time. Um, so in the end, we succeeded. We managed to repeal the bad text that would have uh, called for a restriction of freedom of panorama to non-commercial uses only. But I also felt very, very disappointed and, to be honest, a bit depressed because we did not manage to get the positive freedom of panorama text through. So in the end, we invested a lot of work and seemingly got absolutely nothing out of it. However, um, this wasn't completely true. And to understand why this wasn't true, we need to go a little bit back in time. So in 2004, uh, Wikimedia Belgium was founded. And um, it was founded in the um, chambers of the president of the federal parliament of Belgium. Very fancy room, like there were pictures of the royal family, carpets on the walls, and you know, everything you can imagine. And, um, well, this founding, you know, there was champagne and everything, so um, we had at the entrance set up some agitation and propaganda materials, and a lot of them actually explaining the public policy issues we have. And one thing we also had is, like, a big poster of the Atomium Blackout, and saying, hey, guys, we can't really use it and, you know, put pictures from Belgium on Wikipedia, because um, copyright law sucks. So, you know, we had some champagne, we talked to the politicians that were there, and this is the president of the Belgian Federal Parliament. And he said, well, guys, don't worry, we'll help you, you know, we'll, we'll fix this, don't worry. And what also happened is that one of the members of the parliament who was in the committee responsible for copyright reform actually signed up on the spot and became a member of Wikimedia Belgium. So we thought, great, you know, I mean, this is, we're going to get this done hand over fist. But, well, it wasn't that easy because although we kept talking to the people, they started not really answering to us. They started saying, well, we have other things to do. Well, there is a four-year government work plan. Well, maybe next season. Well, I don't know. I don't have time. I don't know. My dog ate my homework. All kinds of excuses you can imagine. It was, like we, it was impossible for us to get any traction on this. So we thought this is never going to happen, you know, they're just, they were just telling us stuff while drinking champagne, you know, and then they'll forget, they completely forgot about us. But then this failed European Parliament vote came. And during this campaign, we were, we were convincing the European Parliament to actually not accept a limited freedom of panorama. We also talked to a lot of Belgian members of the European Parliament. And uh, Frédéric Ries, who is a member of the um, French-speaking liberals, ask the Commission whether they plan to do anything on it in the future. And Jean-Jacques de Guy, who is a member of the Dutch-speaking Liberals, asked the Belgian government whether they plan to do anything on this. So suddenly we had traction in Belgium. Suddenly, like people, although the European campaign failed, picked that up and brought it back to Belgium. Um, together with our member in the parliament, like the member of Wikimedia Belgium, who's also a member of the parliament, then we, you know, we, we talked to them and then Suddenly, we had one of the government parties proposing a freedom of panorama law in the Belgian federal parliament. This is the actual law proposal, bilingually, of course. Um, and, um, well, the fight wasn't over because, of course, the opposition, the socialists, tried to do two things. They proposed a non-commercial restriction, the same thing that happened in the European parliament. It's a recurring issue. 
And the other thing, which was actually much more interesting, is they proposed an attribution restriction. So they realized, okay, you know, if we don't get a non-commercial restriction, then we want every commercial use to require attribution of the architect or the, or the artist. Which, I mean, to be honest, is something we can't really argue against because, I mean, attribution is presumably that bit of copyright law we like, although that would make life for photographers almost impossible because it's very hard to tell who built every building. Anyway, what we did is, uh, because we didn't want, of course, the non-commercial restriction and we were afraid of things taking the bad turn, is we read through all the um, um, arguments that were shared in the Belgian Federal Parliament and um, we wrote up a frequently asked, asked questions um, page that we sent to everybody. And um, this was quite successful because it gave concrete answers to concrete arguments the opposition had asked. So what happened is that when the dossier went into the, um, into the plenary for discussion, Catherine Lalue from the, from the Parti Socialist, so from the Socialist, started attacking Freedom of Panorama and saying that it's taking away the rights of the authors and it's horrible and it must be restricted to non-commercial. But then actually the, the, the government spokesperson used our FAQ, they really quoted it word by word, our argumentation, to say no, 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 this is not true and you know, it's because of this and that. And basically they really took our sentences word by word. And in the end what happened is that um, the whole thing got adopted, 85 to 42. And now we're waiting for the king to get, to stop parading around, literally. Um, to sign the paper, then it will be published in the state newspaper and 10 days later we can send you a postcard with the atomium. Um, however, this of course is not the end of the whole thing because what the first thing we did after that is, well, we ping-ponged it back to the European level. Well, to be honest, first we had a few beers <laughs> and then we sent the European Commission um, basically an email saying, hey guys, this and this happened in Belgium. And what is very interesting here, well, I don't think you can see the email, but the answer of the commission was, oh, great, that's good news. What happened in France? So because the commission suddenly had gotten used to us giving them information about what's going on with copyright in all other European countries instead of using their own structures. Um, so um, basically it was pinged back and uh, Marco Giorello is um, basically the deputy head of unit of copyright in the European Commission and we work a lot with him. And Marco is now responsible for the Freedom of Panorama consultation that um, finished a few days ago. And Marco is also responsible for drafting the copyright reform for the European Commission. Now Marco has a problem. Everybody is asking Marco to make copyright more foreseeable, more clear, to make the rules understandable and applicable so you know everybody knows what to expect. At the same time, everybody's asking Marco to make copyright more flexible, you know, to make it more, you know, to, to make it breed, to make it like allow new uses. And Marco doesn't know how to square the circle, literally. <laughs> so Marco has also a second problem. We are asking him for freedom of panorama, but all the red countries on this map are telling him, no, 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 no. You should not change freedom of panorama. We are fine the way we are. So how can we help Marco? we can help him by basically turning as many of these countries that are red on this map green. And this is how we get political traction in Brussels. Of course, I can do this alone, so this is why we rely on the weasels. And um, here I want to actually br bridge back to our volunteer network because we have a lot of people that help us and we have a lot of people that are active once in a while, but we have a few people in a few countries, a few groups that are really, really amazingly active and I call them super weasels, which is a new category I invented like about a day ago. <laughs> now, these super weasels are, for instance, Eva and Raul in Estonia. So what Eva and Raul did, they talked to the Estonian Academy of Arts and got them in writing to say that freedom of panorama is unreasonable, inhumane, and unnecessary. Um, they also uh, managed to get a one hour long meeting with um, with uh, Vice President of the Commission, Andros Ansip. And what he said, he told them, hey guys, I really need some quotes about freedom of panorama so I can use them in, in Brussels. And of course they provided them and this is where the work of Eva and Raoul ping pong back to Brussels, to my work. Another good example is Samuel Legov from Wikimedia France. 
Now, he's a genius. Um, he worked with Wikimedia France to actually get a new copyright exception in France. It's not a full one. We got a non-commercial freedom of panorama in France. But hey, I'm not kidding you when I quote the French government actually going around in Brussels and saying no new copyright exceptions only over our dead body. They actually said that. And now suddenly we managed to push a new copyright exception through into French law in Paris. So suddenly they had to change the whole thing. Um, he also tells me what um, the advisors of the French government said on this or that subject, which actually makes me more useful for the European Commission, which again shows how the work in France actually ping-pongs ping back into the work in, in Brussels and we can really work as a network. In England, we have Owen and James. Now, Owen and James are great in arguments, they're great at writing articles, and they have really good connections to the Intellectual Property Office, which means that when we're negotiating the new UK-EU agreement, um, me and them will be working on making sure that nothing bad gets written into it. We have Jan in the Czech Republic. Well, Jan, he's really good at media work. Let's just put it this way. I mean, he writes messages that are targeted for every different media outlet in the country, and he gets the right people to deliver them. But Wikimedia Czech Republic also did a coalition for open education that includes their national broadcaster and the largest search engine in the country. Now, one little known fact about the Czech Republic is that they're the only EU country where Google is not predominant. They have a national search engine that is um, at least as important in Google, as Google. And this means that um, there being so little European companies that manage to be on the same level as Google, these people have direct access to European commissioners. So they were so nice, we had a meeting with them in Prague. They wrote a position paper on freedom of panorama and sent it to the commission saying that for this European search engine that manages to compete with Google, freedom of panorama is essential and they cannot work without it. So here again, their work in, in Prague helped me in Brussels and vice versa. Then, of course, honorary mention to Wikimedia Belgium. By the way, our next goal is freedom of panorama in Luxembourg. And I just want to finish with um, that. Um, I want to encourage you to be like Jan, to be like Eva, and play public policy ping pong with me. Thank you. If you have any questions, I'll come and bring you the microphone. Okay, Toby. So first of all, thank you so much for what you do. I'm always amazed to hear how good it works and how far it has come over the last years. Thank you so much. Uh, one question, you had a number of very good examples of where things work, where progress is made, but of course most of the countries in the world and even in the EU are not part of that list. So what can be done to get more traction in these countries where reform is still needed and we're still a bit low on progress? You mean in countries outside of Europe, or...? Where do you have volunteers and Ah, you mean in... So, um, about EU countries, right? Um, I, I, I get the feeling that the people who will get active on their own and will proactively, you know, activate themselves and take the initiative are already there. So, in order to, like, basically fill the blanks, we need to... Well, we need to go there on the ground and start talking to people private, personally and encouraging them to participate. So I plan on making this over the next 12 months a priority, basically proactively looking out for new weasels and, you know, basically fostering, or I don't know how you call that. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, creating new weasels, uh, it won't happen automatically, and a lot of people need to be encouraged and they need a personal conversation with you before they start doing stuff. And, um, well, this is what I will do over the next 12 months as a priority. Anybody else? Right. I'm, I'm always amazed when the audience is speechless. It was either great or horrible. You had one question. Wow. All right. Um, so... Um, my accent kind of gives it away. I'm I'm a Eurosceptic Brit. <laughs> um, sorry about that. Um, so, doesn't this history tell us that it's 
probably not that useful to try to work at European level because the countries don't want to be standardized with each other. It's much better to start at a local level and work upwards. Well, I think the story says that only local level didn't work, only European level didn't work, but once we managed to connect the two, suddenly we, we got traction and we have real results. So I think that's my answer. I would uh, just like to comment the previous comment. I'm from Wikimedia ST. I work with Eva and Raul. Hello. Go, woo, and uh, they've actually told me that it's it's the opposite. In Estonia, it tends to be the position of the local legislators that they they tend to wait for the European legislation rather than to try to pass it like independently. All right, thanks, and I'll introduce Nicole and Cornelius next. <laughs> Oh, okay, well, yeah, thank you. <laughs>